as I'm sure you, you're very well aware, for most of us men, we, even as young boys, we're taught that when we fall down, get up, dust it, it off, off and keep yeah. going. Yeah. And so that's what I had been conditioned to do. It wasn't even as though people were trying to hurt me in, in telling me that that was just kind of the norm. And so I knew the wounds were there, but I didn't understand that they were actually in some sense. And I want to be very careful about how I say this, but those were all orchestrated by the Lord to point me to himself and then ultimately to point me to who he wanted me to be. But I just thought that they were the, the the result of society and the result of my own sinfulness. And so I'll deal with it and move on. But I really wasn't deep into why they were there and what they were telling me. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to View from the Top podcast, where we help family first business owners and entrepreneurs get through the valleys and up the mountain to their very own view from the top. We're so glad you joined us today. My name is Kevin, also known as Wally Wallenbeck, and I've got Aaron, also known as Big A Walker, as our host today. Big A, how you doing, man? Here we are. Here we are. Uh, your host today, I think that's what you said. Like, I was the host the last interview, too, and hopefully the next. You're not getting rid of me, are you, Wally? No. <laughs> <laughs> you are the host, you know, just here today. So the, uh, I'm here today. The, Hey, I wanted to talk about something for a second. I don't want to embarrass you here and uh -oh. my daughter is going to listen to it and I'm about to make some people mad, but <laughs> like I came over to your house the other day and we did our one-on-one -on -one together. That was yeah. fun. By the way, I enjoyed that just so you know, Yeah, okay. but your dog like jumped up in my lap and he starts licking on me. I'm like, what, what get, get, and you finally go, Oh, whatever your name was, get, get down, get down. I don't mean to be offensive, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big pet guy. You know, I'll go over to my daughter's house too. And Lonnie is her dog's name and I'll pick up the dog, you know, and the dog will start just trying to lick. I'm like, I don't, I don't want you licking on me. What is it, Kevin, with you and Brooke and some of these other folks, like y'all are like, treat these animals like people, like help Help me understand. All right. So first, bit. first, I'm not that animal owner, by the way. I'm just throwing that out there just because I have a small dog that likes people. Uh, you know, you could see that as you could see that as as an honor as well. Right. Because there's people that come to our house and the dog just, you know, her name's Annabelle. She just growls and bears. I got to change my her. attitude about your dog. Then it sounds like so I know, man, like you could look at it two different family. ways. Right. You could. No, that's I, a great I do point. know that I am embarrassed. I'm not one of those people though. That's like all about their dog. I mean, I like my dog. She's great. My wife Lux likes our dog more than I do, but, uh, I say that, you know, have you ever owned a dog? Yeah, man, we had dogs my whole life, but they were outside. They were like a dog. They ah. didn't lay up on the couch and lick on me and sit at the table and pet them and groom them and put sweaters on them. And, you know, matching sweaters, like really, like you're going to put a sweater That's on a your lot. dog sure. that matches your sweater. I see people do it. I'm like, what are you thinking? And like, I know we just lost half our audience, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't, we had, we had a dog as a black lab. His name was Ransom. He was the best dog. That's we had to name, name him name. Ransom yeah. because I had to keep offering ransoms in the neighborhood for people to bring him back because <laughs> he kept running off. Now I know why he ran off and I, he didn't like me. But uh, anyway, 13 years we had Ransom. He was a great dog. Baby was my dog at home when I was a kid. Fritz was a Vimeraner bird dog we had. Uh, yeah, we had great dogs, but I'm just... just We're not, not liking there. dogs too much. You know their names going no, way back. No, so they, they must have made an impression. Dogs outside. I'm talking about inside dogs is what I'm talking about. Ones that lick <laughs> on you. Hey, listen, let's get on to our guest, man. Yeah. Listen, Ryan Miller is unbelievable. I mean, this guy tells a story that you're not going to believe. He was at the shooting that they had in Las Vegas back in 2017. And uh, about 860 people were injured in this. It's uh, one of the largest um, mass deadliest shootings in United States history. And, uh, man, he was there. And the things that he did to protect Michelle, his wife, and mm -hmm. – Lost his best friend uh, in the shooting, uh, and it was just gut-wrenching. But the things that he talks about uh, related to the wounds that we deal with, and it really kind of opened his eyes to a lot of the wounds that he's dealing with today. And I want to tell you, man, it was just a touching interview. 
Yeah, there's one one point in there. He he mentioned something that uh, I challenged him on a little bit. Just that, not challenged him, but I, I just had never thought of it that way before. And I think I think a lot of our listeners are going to be listening to this and going, "Man, I just hadn't hadn't thought about life that way." Yeah, if you've got past wounds that are unattended, you've got to listen to this interview in its entirety. Hey, let's get Ryan in here and get into the interview. All right, let's get him. Ryan Miller's in the house. Man, I'm pretty jazzed up, Ryan, that you're here with us. Thank you for taking this time and uh, hanging out with Wally and I. I'm good, man. I'm excited. I'm excited. Been uh, been a long time coming. Yeah. Man, you're doing good. Things uh, good out on the coast? I'm doing pretty well, you know, dealing with, uh, I I should say, tolerating California, but at the same time, enjoying a, a beautiful fall day. So I can't complain. Hey, if you come this way anytime soon, bring the flag with you. That's what Congress did. I'm teasing my buddies. I got two or three buddies that live out there. And I said, man, just listen, before it falls off in the ocean or it goes to be its own country, we were on a call the other day and a couple of guys on there. And I said, man, we're represented here in two countries. And everybody looked around and said, two countries? I said, yeah, we got the U.S. and California. So uh, you take control of it out there, Ryan. But oh, man, it's good. just so good to have you. You just got so much energy and you're doing so many cool things. I know. The audience just heard your, you know, your bio a little bit more about you, and we won't go into that. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to dive right in with you on, and I've got something that I want to read uh, to the to the listeners. The deadliest mass shooting committed by an individual in United States history occurred on October the first, two thousand seventeen. Stephen Paddock a 64-year-old man from Mesquite, Nevada, opened fire on a crowd attending the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival on the Las Vegas Strip in Nevada. From his 32nd floor suite in the Mandela Bay Hotel, he fired more than 1,000 bullets, killing 60 people and wounding 413. The ensuing panic brought the total number of injured to approximately 867 people. About an hour later, he was found dead in his room from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Ryan, you were there that day. Yeah, it's never, uh, it, it's never great to hear that headline again, and it's never, never, never good to, to hear his name recited, but yes. Hey, take us back there. You and Michelle had gone out for this concert and you were enjoying the evening. It was nearing the end of the concert. I think it was the third day, the final song, the entertainer was up and all of a sudden, like what happened? Take us there. Yeah. So uh, that had been, that was our second uh, Route 91 festival. That was our 17th concert that year, uh, live show. Uh, So we were very accustomed to loud music, great parties. The country music community is, is incredible, just a a wonderful family. And so about five or six songs into Jason Aldean's set there on that last night, um, we heard what sounded like fireworks being shot off into the air. And, um, I actually have some of that on video and, um, it didn't sound like fireworks, you know, going back, but you just don't assume anything else. And so, Again, about two minutes later, we saw a collected round of gunfire. Uh, Again, we thought it was firecrackers going off on the ground, which was not the norm in a show like that. Um, And so people were a little bit startled. uh, But then finally, when the first round of uh, sweeping gunfire uh, uh, rained out, Uh, Jason ran off the back of the stage, they killed the lights, and everybody was looking around just puzzled as to as to what was going on. And Um, we froze, um, there was some quiet for a period of time. Nobody knew what to do. And and the next wave happened. And as the next wave happened, it it hit that, that, that was in fact gunfire. And so the crowd of 20,000 all hit the deck at the same time. And we just, we had no idea where it was coming from or, or what was going on. And, so we're laying on the ground and my wife is screaming at the top of her lungs and I rolled over just freaking out as to what may have happened. And thank God it was somebody that was on her crushing her leg, uh, not, you know, not something devastating having been happened to her. So I pulled that person off of her. I started to pick my wife up and 
she turned over and said, oh my gosh, I think Nicole's been hit. And Nicole was one of our close friends. She was my best friend's girlfriend at the time. And so we turned to look at her and she was in fact bleeding uh, from the lower right side of her. And um, so we rolled her over and um, tried to kind of collect ourselves and um, started to stand up. And just as we stood up, he hit again with another wave of gunfire. And there was this split second moment, and this sounds like the most valiant thing ever, and it just absolutely wasn't, but there was this split second where I had to decide what I was going to do next. And I questioned jumping on top of my wife. There was just this moment of like, I can't believe I'm actually going to do this. She went down, I jumped on top of her, and I just remember laying face down on top of her, and I was holding on to her as tight as I could, just cringing, waiting for uh, you know, a, a bullet to, to, to hit me. Um, thank God it didn't. We rolled over, got up again. We tried to tend to Nicole. Uh, she was bleeding. She was saying that she couldn't feel her feet, couldn't feel her legs, and so it was kind of just working its way up. And so my friend from one side, me from the other, we tried to get underneath her to pick her up. She was a pretty big girl. So that was kind of hard to do. And, you know, to sound crass, I mean, it was just kind of dead weight at that point. So she was of no help and another wave of gunfire. And so I hit the ground again. And as we get back up, the crowd started to run. And I just knew that there was going to be a stampede and there was no way on God's green earth I was going to let go of my wife. And so I was trying to hold on to her with one arm. I was trying to grab Nicole with the other, with my buddy Chad underneath her arms. and We couldn't move her. And I just decided that I had to protect my wife. There was no way that I could stay out in the open air. I didn't know what was still to come. And so we ran off to the side and as we did, we ran about a hundred feet off to the side, kind of hunkered down under some bleachers and uh, or against them. And people were sardine canned underneath, screaming and crying, calling loved ones, screaming out to God. And I, I, there was this there is this definitive moment where, um, as gunfire's coming, it's pinging off the bleachers. You can see it going by. You can see smoke hitting the ground. Um, I caught just a silhouette of my buddy standing out over Nicole and. It was just this eerie feeling, and, and I didn't know if we were ever going to get out. And so I, I looked my wife in the eyes, <clears throat> um, and I told her I loved her. And I tried to be as confident about that statement as I could. Um, I, I, I wanted her to know things were going to be okay, but at the same time, it was almost like I was telling her goodbye, not knowing if one or both of us was ever going to leave. Um. By the grace of God, we were able to, to work our way to the back across about 100 yards of the venue to the other side and escape that venue um, and, and, and on to what ended up being chaos for about six more hours, eight more hours. But that was kind of the moment of the event. And, you know, so much of it was just it was reaction. I'd, I'd, I've never been in war. I've never been in the middle of a gunfight. You know, you just don't prepare for anything like that. Uh, and yet... Um, I, I guess I just went into a mode of protecting my wife and trying to do everything I could to make sure that she was going to be out of harm's way. And thankfully, you know, we were able to, for the most part, you know, at least us to avoid any serious injury and, um, and, and move on with the rest of the night, which was just more chaos. And I'll break just in case, you know, in case there's anything to say there, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was absolute chaos. Ryan, you, you didn't even know where the fires were coming from. So you didn't even know which way to run, right? You're just yeah. So hearing this. And so it took a few minutes before they even discovered where the shots were coming from. Well, so from our side of things, uh, we didn't know for hours. And so when we were, when we were popping up in between fire, um, I thought it was coming from the street. The way that it sounded was uh, it was coming from the street. So about 20 years ago, there was this notorious bank robbery that had happened. Guys were in full body armor walking down the streets of L.A. And that's what I thought was happening. I actually thought we were under terrorist attack. People were coming down the streets and they were shooting up over the venue wall. It was a big brick wall. If I'd have known that fire was elevated like that, I would have just stayed tucked down for the entire time until it stopped. But because we thought they were coming in, we had to get out of there. 
knowing though that it was elevated, running across that venue in just complete open air, we were all sitting ducks. So yeah, I mean, it was just, it, it was crazy because we didn't know who it was, where it was coming from, really what to do. The, the police officers were doing the best they could to direct people in different directions. But even then, I mean, they were steering people into the line of fire without even knowing it. Ryan, recently we were together and you showed me a photograph of a hat that Michelle was wearing. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, so um, to cut off some of the in-between, so we ended up down in the basement of the Tropicana Hotel. That's where they had funneled quite a few of us. And there was a couple thousand people that from the venue that had ended up down there. And there's blood on the carpets and blood on the walls because people had been shot and were just running and so we were, we were down there. The, uh, the staff had brought in blanket or, uh, 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 blankets and pillows just for us to kind of lay out on. They were quarantining us there until we could, we could move again. And so we were laying and, and, uh, Michelle, she took off her hat and she said, Hey babe, I, I, I think something hit my hat and she had been wearing this foam trucker hat backwards. So foam front mesh back, but she was wearing it backwards and right through the crown of the hat, it, it kind of looked like something had hit it, but because tension was so high, my adrenaline was still going crazy and I didn't want to make things worse. I just shook it off. I said, no, 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 no. I said, don't worry about it. It's nothing. She laid her head back down on my lap and we went on. Well, we finally were released from that venue at four o'clock in the morning. We went back to a friend's hotel and when we were there, I said, hey, let me see your hat again. And I took it off of her head and sure enough, uh, a round of ammunition had passed through the crown of that hat. I mean, like I showed you in the picture, I mean, it went in one side, it blew out the other side, it grazed the inside of the foam of that hat without touching her head, taking it off of her head. I mean, it's hard at times to say that I'm thankful in lieu of what happened of our friend losing her life and so many others being so devastated, but God's grace protected me. I, I, I wouldn't be the same human being had my wife's life been taken that night. And so it was just this reminder, even in the midst of absolute hell, that God is present and God is good and, and God will continue to, to sustain his plan for us until he calls us individually home. Oh, wow. Yeah, man, that is so heavy. Uh, I can't even fathom being in a situation like that and um, so close, right? I mean, that was a millimeter from yeah. taking yeah. Michelle. And yeah. so, yeah. man, we just got to be so grateful each and every day that we have now, right? I know you've been doing a work recently uh, related to, you even say that every human being on earth has been wounded, right, to some degree. Um, t talk to us about that a little bit. Tell us a little bit more of your backstory. Give us a little bit of context about where this work started. Yeah. So, um, route 91 was the catalyst, uh, to that, uh, to kind of just uh, unpacking my story. So I went back to work, um, two weeks later, like the company that I worked for at the time was just incredibly gracious, gave me as much space I needed, but I needed some routine. I needed to get back into a routine. And so the gym was part of that and then getting back to work. And so <clears throat> two weeks later, I drive into my office in Newport beach, greeted by some employees. And I, I go into my office and, um, I, my office was on the corner, floor to ceiling window. It faced out towards the Newport coast. I mean, just beautiful. And I said to myself, what the hell are you doing with your life? And it was just the most incredible question to ask because at that point I was making a healthy six figure salary. I had great benefits. I had a half a million in stock. Um, just, I was healthy. My marriage was like, all these things were good. And what I realized was, was that was God beginning to show me God, God didn't say the hell part, but God was beginning to show me. Uh, that um, I had been living less than the greatest version of the life that he had called me to live. And so I started to uncover this backstory, which included my parents divorced when I was six. My dad left uh, my mom with uh, myself at six, my brother at three. My mom was a single mom, did not work. Uh, when, when, when my parents got divorced, she worked two and three jobs to provide for us. Um, and, and that was really what started as I started to look back, that 
actually was what started this really um, just lifestyle of struggle. Um, I, 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 I lived a lot of my life trying to prove to myself that I was worthy, not knowing at that time that it was because of being abandoned uh, by my dad and, and not understanding why I wasn't good enough to be, to be, to be kept and, and, and stayed with and cared for. I was trying to fit into crowds, getting into fights and getting arrested. Um, I share in my in my story a, a very poor decision to lose my virginity uh, during spring break my junior year of high school led to a series of events that uh, were, were fairly devastating to me that piled on into like my early marriage and you would have th thought that being the product of divorce and knowing how how bad that was that I would have done everything but that and yet uh, one uh, one night, I nearly slept with another woman, uh, throwing away my own divorce because I was so self-centered and so selfish as to what I wanted from life and what I was set out to do. But I never realized that that was all the result of just dusting off or burying every wound that had been committed by me or committed on me previous to that. I mean, it was just, it was a pile on and I wasn't taught how to deal with them, to process my emotions, to understand who I was, to understand what I really valued. And so that, that work just continued to, uh, to uncover really the man that God had called me to live. Did you even know at the time these wounds existed? You know, I mean, so like the wound of divorce. So that led to two different instances. So I didn't speak to my biological dad. Um, I went to live with him my sophomore year of high school. We had a falling out. I ran away. I didn't speak to him for about a year and a half, almost two years. We reconnected uh, for quite a few years. And then the last time I saw him was my wedding night of 2001. And I did not see him again until 2011. And that was hurt, frustration, and anger. So I understood that the wounds existed. But as I'm sure you, you're very well aware, for most of us men, we, even as young boys, we're taught that when we fall down, get up, dust it off, off, and keep yeah. going. Yeah. And so that's what I had been conditioned to do. It wasn't even as though people were trying to hurt me in, in telling me that. That was just kind of the norm. And so I knew the wounds were there, but I didn't understand that they were actually in some sense, and I want to be very careful about how I say this, but those were all orchestrated by the Lord to point me to himself and then ultimately to point me to who he wanted me to be. But I just thought that they were the, the, the result of society and the result of my own sinfulness. And so I'll deal with it and move on. But I really wasn't deep into why they were there and what they were telling me. You know, go ahead, Will. Brian. Yeah, Ryan, you say the statement you just made, and maybe you'll unpack this a little bit more, but um, <laughs> so my my dad left my mom when I was five hmm. and uh, got a divorce, and, and he was in my life um, for, you know, my whole life. He's been in my life, but that event still occurred, and I never have looked, I never I'm 49 years old. I've never looked at it the way you just described it. And I'm not sure I believe you. <laughs> I was going to say that out loud, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not sure sitting in this moment, what you just said that, that I have to, I have to sit with that for a bit and think through that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, but, I know that all things work together for good and what God's called us to. Like, I know the truth of that, but I've never yeah. thought about it in that way. Yeah, so so kind of I, I don't want to overdo this too much, but I think it's extremely important. So particularly as it relates to our faith, the the greatest gift that we were ever given was the most evil act this world has ever seen. I mean, when when the father gave the son over to the evil ones, I mean there there is no more unexplainable event of using evil for good. And if we don't want to use that one, because some people will say, well, that's God. And, you know, he, he does things that nobody else can do. I mean, we can look to stories like in Genesis 50, you know, or all throughout the end of the book of Genesis, you know, when in Genesis 50, 20, it says what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And he's talking about the fact that Joseph's own brothers mm -hmm. sent him off 
into imprisonment, to slavery. I mean, they, they basically left him for dead. And look at the way that God used that event. He didn't remove Joseph from the evil. As a matter of fact, he left him in it and allowed God to be glorified and, G- and Joseph to be built up to one day really be kind of at the head of even that, you know, even that tribe of brothers. So it's not easy. I, I, I I say this all the time to people, like people think that I'm kind of glorifying the bad or the wounds or even evil in a sense, like, don't worry, God's using it for good. No, 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 no. Like if I could, I would do anything apart from giving up my wife and kids to go erase any one of the evil acts that's happened, including my own parents' divorce. But had those things not happened... Not only would I not be the man that I am, but I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the end of the story, but my dad is now one of my best friends in the world. Had my dad and I's relationship not been broken, that set off this chain of offense that led me to faith, that led me to repent of my sin, to forgive my dad for his own. And then my dad actually ended up in almost the same time frame when I wasn't talking to him, coming to faith on his own. Mm. Had those evil events not occurred to lead us to that point, we would not have the relationship that we do. So I understand the fact that it, that's hard to sit with, like, but it, it's there. Again, I mean, in the book of Job, Job talks about the fact that he felt evil or he felt piercing arrows, but he clarifies the fact that those were from God. So we, we, just, we just need to see that God is not the orchestra, orchestrator of evil, but at the same time, because of the fallen world we live in, he's going to use evil acts for good. And every time that we look back on those evil acts, the, the bad, the wounds, the hurt, the tragedy, we see that we're better as the result of it. That's a good word. Ryan, you say uh, that these... Uh, incidents that happen in our life left untreated or untreated or mistreated, uh, it can cause serious complications. What, what do you think would have happened as a result of you not coming to faith? Or what would you suggest to the listeners out there today that's dealt with these horrific uh, incidents in their life? Like what would be the next right step in order to treat those things so that they uh, don't have these serious complications in life? So I, I have kind of a, a formula that has just naturally occurred for me. So I think the first one is, and this is more so for the men, even than the women, though, I'm sure that there's women that are going to fall into this camp. The first thing is, is we have to admit the wound or the hurt. We have to admit the fact that, you know, divorce hurt me, that, uh, my own sin in some way hurt me. So I think it's addressing it and just naming it that it, it in fact happened. Second then to that is what were the impacts of that wound on my life? So there are going to be negative impacts and positive impacts. And I think that it's important that we understand how that impacted us because that will allow us to see what chain of events happened as the result of that. One thing led to another, led to another. It's just the dominoes that began to fall. And then finally, once we can understand the impacts, then step three is really then understanding how that is shaping us to be a better version of who we are. Those three things I think are extremely helpful as it relates to kind of diagnosing and understanding why they happened and how we can use them. But even in that, and this is for every single person out there, and I'm sure Aaron, that you would agree with this wholeheartedly, there is never going to be a way outside of coming to faith in Jesus Christ that anybody will ever completely understand nor be able to reconcile and then redeem the wounds that have happened to us or the wounds that we've done to other people. I'm not, I'm not saying that you look at it differently. It's you look at it in a different light that I think actually you, that that's the point. That's the biggest point of all, because some people say, okay, so I'll come to faith. I'll heal from these wounds. I'll feel better. And then I can move on. And you know, this, right? Like no way. Some of those things, the lasting effects are there regardless of faith or not. But, but Jesus gives us an answer to that story that I don't think that we can find anywhere else because everywhere else society says, you know, 
Band-aid it, bandage it, callous it, run from it, um, you know, ignore it, whatever. But God says address it because there's purpose in it because I've done it too. And so I think that that's the thing that has helped me the most is every time that I've been hurt, even now since then, like th this, this doesn't stop, you know, that the hurts continue. And so I just run back to, to the Lord to understand more of who he is so I can better understand why he is doing the things he is in my life. You know, you said that, uh, to me, you said that, uh, really the, the, bigger wounds, they, they, they kept getting larger and more impactful and they, they came back to haunt you to your words. How do you deal with that? Even as a believer now, like, what do you do with those regrets? What do you do with those thoughts, things that come back that continually plague you and say, you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. What, what do you do with those thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, that, that just happened to me recently, and it does quite often because I hurt my wife a lot. Though I didn't cheat on her, there were a lot of ways that I just mistreated her for the first five or six years of our marriage. And there's times that we'll talk about that. And we were recently, she was on my podcast with me, and we were talking about our early our struggles in marriage. And it hurts to hear that stuff. And the only way that I can deal with it is just knowing that God's forgiven me because I truly have laid it out for him. And then I'm no longer that man. I, ju I just don't know how else to, to, to reconcile it other than that. I mean, it, it, it I can tell myself that, um, you know, sin is a liar and that the story is going on in my head, in fact, not true. And that, and that's there, but I think more than anything, then the truth that I know to be true is I have repented and been forgiven and God is transforming me. And as the result of that, I will continue to strive to get better and better. Because if not, that wound is going to reopen. It's going to refester. It's going to spread itself again. Because I think actually that's what happens, Aaron, over time is we think we've dealt with it. Maybe we kind of do. We get to a quote unquote healthy place in life. Something triggers. It reopens that wound again. And we're back in the same place we were. It's like the alcoholic that, you know, thinks that 10 years is long enough for them to have a drink again. And maybe for some it could be, but for the most part, they're always going to be an alcoholic. Um, it's not who they are, but it's, it, it, it's the sin and struggle that they deal with. And so therefore they have to abstain for the rest of their life. Like we just have to hit that head on and move forward. Ryan, no one wants to talk about their shortcomings and their failures, and you're so open to do, to doing that. Was this a did this take a period of time for you to be authentic and transparent and vulnerable? What is your motivation in sharing your story today? Two reasons. Uh, the first one is because I lived the first 28 years of my life trying to be somebody that I wasn't, and. I don't want to be that person. I just want to be all of who God who has was created. That? Tell me, who was that person? You were trying to be somebody you weren't. What, who were you trying to be? I, I, I guess I was trying to be the person that fit in with everybody, that was as successful, if not more successful than everybody else, that everybody looked up to and looked at as the model citizen for society, you know, and the model of success and the model for marriage and the mo whatever. I just, I was trying to be all things to all people thinking in some way that that was going to make me better. Um, and that was a miserable, miserable prison to live in because I can't be all those things. I'm not all those things. And so you, you wouldn't even think I could understand some of this even more like, uh, not to sound weird, but you're a good looking guy. You're a big guy. You're muscular. You've got a beautiful wife. You had a great job, but you still didn't feel like you measured up. You still are like, hey, I'm I'm still not there. No, because I mean, I I haven't gotten to here yet, but you know, the multimillionaire is you know can be the most miserable poor person too. I just think that like we see these models in society, both men and women, but we see these models in society for what life should quote unquote look like, and then we realize that none of those things in and of themselves are fulfilling for us. There's got to be something more. There's something deeper. There's more something more purposeful. I mean, ultimately, freedom is living fully as the person that God has created you to be, not me living as the person 
that you are. So I think that 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 was that first realization was I don't want to be fake anymore. I don't want to be something else. I just want to be all of me. Second to that actually kind of connects back to what you just said. It's really easy for people to look at me now and say, um, you know, you're pretty well dialed in in life. You look successful. Your marriage is together. And offline, I had said to you, look at, I'm an open book with many torn pages. I want, I want to live 100% transparent to the world. Obviously, there is some context in which privacy is important, but but more often than not, I just want to let the world in to see that nothing is perfect in life, that I'm that I'm striving to be the best that I can be. I want to be successful. I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled, but I struggle and I hurt. And I feel like that's the relatability that people need to then step into their own calling that God has for them. And so it's just this, I don't know, public form of accountability where it's just like, here I am. I want you to see all of me, not just the good parts that's so that are so easy to put up for society to see. Brian, you use the term fully alive, fully uh, living the life that God's called you to be. What, what does that look like? Paint a picture to me. What does fully alive look like to you? So I'm not... I think this is a little bit hard to articulate. I think it, I think it's similar in one sense to saying like, uh, "What is God's purpose for your life?" Um, but I'm going to try to answer that the best way that I, I've come to understand. So, I can understand from the passions that God has put inside of me, from the roles that He's called me to, who He has called me to be. So, the things I'm interested in, the things that I'm excited about, um, the 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 relationships with my wife, my kids, my friends, my family. And so being fully alive in that is not caring in, in, in the right way, not caring about what other people think. I'm very concerned about how other people see me because I do want to model what it means to be godly and Christ-like in society. But at the same time, I don't, I don't care if people think I'm good looking or not or successful or not. I want to be happy and fulfilled in the skin that God has given me, in the relationships that God has given me, in the roles that God has given me. And I've got to tell you, I am a driven, goal-focused, big thinking kind of person. But at the same time, as soon as I came to that realization, I have never been more happy and more fulfilled on a consistent basis than I have just leaning into just being me. Wally, I think I cut you off all ago. Yeah, no worries. So, Ryan, you had you had mentioned that wanting to help people discover. I believe I can't remember exactly how you, you phrased it, but um, you know, recognizing that 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 moment of change and wanting to change and be different and discover for themselves who they are in Christ and and wanting to make that switch from you know, living in comparison to living in your own skin and how God's designed you, right? Can you go back to that, that day in the office a little bit when you asked yourself that question? What, so a lot, a lot of us, right? People listening, I've had moments like this in my life where sometimes maybe that happens quickly for, for some, and maybe it happens over a period of time for others, like that process. What was the process for you to get to there, to, to where you are today? Yeah. So, um, the, the beginning of the process was seven months. So I was working with a a very wise, uh, older man. He was my executive coach. So, uh, with him, with my wife, with the other two pastors of the church that I was serving with at the time and a couple of close friends, I just started asking questions around who I was who they saw me to be, what they believed I was most gifted at, how I was, uh, what I was doing to best invest into and give into their lives and the lives of the people around them. So I was trying to understand, have a better idea of who God made me to be. Like, what was it that God had really gifted me with? What were my true strengths? Not what DISC says, not what the Enneagram says, but truly you know, confirmed and affirmed by those around me. What were the things that I was able to do that they saw as truly being gifts from God, like those unique and specific things? 
And so as I asked more questions, as I shared things that I was dissatisfied with, that I was struggling with, um, it got really, really clear. And, and, and a big part of the clarity came, as a matter of fact, when I understood that I had spent so much of my life living as somebody other than the person that I was created to be. I'm really good at a lot of stuff that sounds, I don't know, maybe a little bit cocky, but that's actually a very dangerous thing because you can get caught up thinking, oh, then I can go be excellent at all kinds of things. Jim Collins says, good is the enemy of great and good really was my enemy for a long time. And so through my own experience, that affirmation, I came to really understand that the gift that God has given me probably above all other gifts as it relates to how I work out uh, supporting and investing into other people is I have this unique ability to be able to see inside of other people the things they can't see inside of themselves, to help bring those things to the surface, and then leverage those things to go get the things that they dream of. And so that is what I started to understand was, yeah, I can lead sales. Yes, I can help build organizations. But ultimately, if I can get inside of people and bring those things out of them, I can create the most successful, productive, fulfilled individuals in this world. And so I started to test that out. And the more that I was testing that out, the more that I was getting affirmation that that was, in fact, one of those gifts that I had. So it really was just a process, but it didn't stop there. I mean, that was it, that kind of seven month season stopped in May of 2018, but I challenged myself to that every single day. You know, when somebody says, you know, you can get up on stage and you're great and you speak so well, I really want to understand what do you mean by that? Because you've told the other 14,000 speakers you've seen pretty much the same thing. I want to know what it was specifically. Was it the way I carried myself or communicated or the passion that I brought or the story that I told? Like, what is it inside of that? Like, I want to tap into those very specific things because I want to be excellent at a couple of things so that I can truly live that fulfilled life that I can produce for my family, that I can enjoy myself. Like, I want it all, but I need to find the narrow lane to get there. There's a, there's something that just a theme in what you're talking about that just keeps ringing in my ears. I can't, I can't ignore. There's a couple things. One is you've got people around you, right? Without people around you, you're just, you're by yourself. And, mm -hmm. and the second thing is you're, you're asking questions. I, I meet so many guys that don't know how to ask themselves questions. Mm. They don't, they, they just live in, and maybe that was you. I know it was me at one point in my life, right? Just yeah. living as a byproduct of the environment around me, never questioning anything. Well, I, I think at least my, my understanding or my assumption is that we were never taught to do anything different. And I don't want to abdicate responsibility. I don't want to say that other people are, 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 are at fault for who I became, but we are brought up, men are naturally brought up in society today. I mean, today it's even more distorted, but to be the individual, to be the front runner, to be the solo guy. I mean, I was told by everybody all my life, like, you're a natural born leader, get out front and go lead. And I'm like, yeah, but no one has ever taught me how to follow anything. And so I don't even understand how to do that. And if I'm the leader all the time, I'm amazing. And so nobody can pour anything into me. I mean, I had a CEO one time, I was 26. I was killing it in sales. And he came to me and he said, Ryan, he says, I believe you need a mentor. I laughed in his face. I, I actually laughed in the CEO of our company's face. And, and I said, a, a mentor? I said, I'm your best sales guy. Why would I ever need that? I was just taught that I just always just went hard and led the charge. And so once I was broken, literally God had to destroy my life to get me to understand that I don't have it all together and I can't do it all on my own. And if I don't have people around me helping me to grow, I'm not going to stay still. I'm literally going to die. Ryan, what's, uh, what's exciting? What are you working on today? I know you've got Ryan James Miller coaching. You do an amazing job with a lot of CEOs and executives. Thank you for that work, by the way. But Anything that you're working on right now you're excited about? Yes. So uh, 24 hours ago from our recording, I submitted uh, the final draft of my book. 
this has been a, a five-month work uh, that I have uh, been working on with a publishing team. Uh, it's a memoir, uh, at least now tentatively titled Wounds, How Hurt, Heartache, and Tragedy Become the Keys to Unlocking Greatness. Um, and what I'm most prayerful for in that and most excited about is not to tell my story, though I am really excited to tell my story. I'm most excited to get that into the hands of another human being that realizes that their story matters too. And I feel like because I've been so vulnerable in writing that story that other people will feel like whatever they think that they're scared to share is not going to be nearly as bad as some of the things that I open up about. And so I'm really hopeful that that book impacts somebody to go change their life and change the world as a result. Well, I can tell you the impact of this interview on my personal life uh, is immeasurable. Mm -hmm. I mean, just hearing your story again, and I knew the majority of your story, you have shared a few things that I wasn't aware of, is very impactful. And so the listeners out there really need to pay attention to what you're talking about with these wounds and deal with those so that we don't have these travesties going forward. Yeah. Ryan, how can folks reach out and reach you if they'd like to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, the best way, because there's so many different spots nowadays, is you can go to my website, ryanjamesmiller.com, and you can find my LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok profiles there, the podcast, and everything else that we've got going on. Ryan, it's been fun today, buddy. Thank you for sharing with us. We certainly enjoy our time together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, do you see what I was saying? I mean, Ryan just laid it all out there. He was so vulnerable. Even in his coaching, he teaches to be authentic and transparent. It's the only way that he can really help you. And he laid it all out in this. And man, I hope that if you've got a wound that's been unattended to, if there's something in your life, some something devastating that's happened, I don't know if it's a financial crisis or a relationship crisis, uh, I hope you go and deal with that. Get somebody professional to walk you through dealing with these wounds. Put that behind you so that you can go out and live your best life ever so that you too can have the view from the top. Thanks for joining us today. The easiest way to connect with us is really through our uh, updated and new weekly email called The Climb. Uh, you're really going to like this thing. It's it's just once a week. It's easy to digest. And uh, there's just bite-sized topics that really every small business owner, entrepreneur, husband, and father can use to help them live a life of success and significance. And so please go ahead, check that out at viewfromthetop.com slash climb to get free access to that newsletter now and get next week's issue. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see y'all next week.